if we can. Okay, if there's no one there, yeah. Yeah, I think it's gonna be a popular one. That Would that be crazy? People can join online. We have 50 people online already, so. Uh, we we're, we're, we have quite a crowd here, so this one might go slightly over four o'clock, two or three o'clock. A fantastic idea. So we're just gonna we're gonna do it in here. One moment for people online. Okay, sorry for the <laughs> sorry for the the mix up there, guys. Um, we we have a, a very large crowd for this presentation, so I'm going to go ahead and start presenting. And uh, the the other group is getting set up in the other room to watch it live from there. Um, and we will uh, just get started. So it seems like this is a popular crowd, even though most of the people are no longer in the room here with me. Um, but we're gonna talk uh, a bit about how to build a public dashboard and still sleep well at night, which uh, someone told me today was a clickbait title. Um, and I think that's probably true. Um,
but it's also important because there are it's it's tempting to build public portals. Uh, there are a lot of public portals out there, public access to data, but there are a lot of considerations that need to uh, be taken into account when doing that. Um, so we'll talk about a few of those. Um, there are many more, but there are a few of the, the really critical ones. Um, security is obviously of, of uh, big importance. Um, performance is another one. Um, and making sure that you're doing this in a way that doesn't compromise or uh, expose access to your operational DHS2 instance or your operational um, system, whatever that happens to be. Um, so just to specify uh, what we're talking about here, we're talking about public dashboards, the first of these, but I'll talk about a couple of these others as well because they are uh, often kind of uh, lumped into the same bucket. Uh, so public dashboards, uh, the way that we're talking about them today, are read-only. They're accessible without any authentication on the public internet. Um, there might be some cases where you have a, a public dashboard that is only visible to a, a, a limited set of people on an intranet or maybe behind a password or something like that. But the general idea of a public dashboard is that it's, it's for the public. It's for everyone, right? Um, COVID uh, dashboards were very popular um, in 2020, 2021 where every country was publishing all of their data for the number of COVID cases every day. Uh, and everyone in the, in the public was, was refreshing every five minutes, right? To see um, what the latest numbers were. So that's what we're talking about here today. And this is talking, ta targeting the general public. So potentially millions and millions of people. That's important to keep in mind. Um, and they're not, uh, it's not targeting experts. So it's not, uh, it's not an operational system. It's not a statistical system. It's not something where you want to, or you need to um, expose really sophisticated tools or, or want people to be trained how to use. Um, this is as opposed to a couple other use cases or, or things that uh, are often bundled into the same concept. Um, or when we, when we talk about public dashboards or public portals, sometimes people assume that we're talking about some other things. And those are, um, just gonna cover them quickly here because we're not gonna talk about them today. Those are uh, data exfiltration, which there's a couple ways to think about this. One of this is uh, push analysis, which is supported in DHIS2. Um, a little bit of a antiquated support for that in DHS2, but there are other ways to get data out of, of, of the system, and in particular to get data into the hands of, to basically where people are anyway. So a, a common request here that we won't touch on today because there's a lot of nuance and, and, and challenges with it, is you have a minister who wants to be able to see their DHS2 data, um, it's not data that you want to open to the public, but the minister doesn't want to remember their password, for example. That comes up quite a lot. So that's another example of trying to get in a get data into the hands of people that should have access to that data without basically removing some barriers from, from them seeing that. Um, we're not going to talk about that today because that's not the purpose of public dashboards. And then the third one here is um, individual access to data. So if you are a tracked entity in DHIS2, if you are a mother and you want to be able to see your own, uh, basically your own history of, of uh, postnatal visits or something, or you want to see the vaccination record of your child, or you want to see the school record of your child, or you want to see your own COVID history and COVID vaccination certificates, those types of things, or even enter some data yourself, like entering, um, uh, data into a nutrition program. So you record your own meals instead of needing to remember it and then tell it to a nurse who records it into the system later. That's another thing we're not going to talk about here today, but is often com confused here. So that uh, is a whole nother uh, can of worms, a whole nother thing that we could talk about another time. So that's the, one, the main thing we're going to talk about. Everybody take a picture of this and scan that, please. Um, if you know of any public dashboards, use this QR code to enter a simple form. And at the end of this, we'll uh, um, just kind of list them out. These are public dashboards, right? So they should be open to the public. Uh, so what we're trying to do is just get a, a list from the, uh, the hundred some odd people who are in this session. Um, if you know of public dashboards, particularly those that are have DHS2 as one of their data sources, um, go ahead and fill out that form.
Um, and to start us off, actually, we're going to give a quick um, uh, go over a, an example of a public dashboard that was developed by the HISP Vietnam team for Laos. Uh, or Laos. Um, and I'm going to turn, yeah, turn it over to my colleagues from HISP Vietnam to do that presentation quickly. Is it working now? Hello, hello. Hello, can you hear me? Okay. Hello? Okay, okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, hi. Um, good afternoon, everyone. So um, my name is Sam. Uh, I work for HIPS Vietnam, but based in Laos, supporting uh, Ministry of Health to uh, do the implementation of DHS2 in Laos. So for me, I would um, talk a little bit about the, how we make the Laos dashboard. So I will just go through the overview, the goals, the aims, and the, the use case. Then uh, my colleague, uh, Nghia, will talk a bit about the technical part. Okay, so okay, so um, uh, like Austin mentioned, most of the goals of the public dashboard is for for us is also uh, more or less the same. So we want this dashboard, or not we want, but the minister or the high level people they need to access to data. Sometimes they don't. We already gave them the username password, but sometimes they cannot remember. They have problem accessing and most of the time they, they don't use laptops like us every day so they rely mostly on their phones and their, their tablets so we come up with this idea so to help them to get access to data so first of all this uh, dashboard that um, i'm presenting here is main, mainly about for decision makers for the high level people to be able to access from their phone so the requirement is quite uh, simple so that they don't need to log in, so they can just go to their website, get the the data immediately. Uh, and the second one is also since they they don't have to remember also where to to get the data. So we want to have one site at least they can come and then go through all the data that they need. They can change the 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 web just to see all the programs. So the public dashboard will get data from multiple. Right now, we get data from multiple DHS2 instances, but in the near future, next phase, we might need to get data from uh, different sources. And as I mentioned, so it should be a mobile first, so they can just view from their phone or tablets, no need to, to use the laptop. And then uh, almost real time, right now we realize on the analytics, so at least um, they get one day behind uh, data. And most importantly, the graph, the chart in the dashboard to tell stories to them immediately. So they don't have to ask, um, ask or ask uh, each program, like what does it mean? At least they can see and they can tell what happened with, with, the, with the data or with the program. So that's the goals. So um, in, for the approach, so once we know what we need to, to have or what we need to build for, for the ministry. So these are the approach we do. So because in Laos, we have different frameworks, we have different uh, indicators, targets. We base on this one, and most of the key indicators on the dashboard are derived from uh, here. So in, in Laos, one thing that uh, important is the National Assembly, they have 10 indicators for MOH to monitor and also to report to back to National uh, Health Assembly, uh, National Assemblies. So these 10, 11 indicators, we try to capture that in the public dashboard so that at least they get some update every month or every quarter 
apart from that also USC, SDG and priority programs. Although we, we cannot get all the data here, but at least we get some, some idea or give them some ideas of how uh, each indicator that are doing. Once we have the list of indicators or the areas that we want to show, we also work with each program. We, want, we work with our partners like the WHO, UNICEF, uh, PSI, and also um, programs in the ministry like MCH, EPI, to define what uh, can be shown and what it will be useful for the high level or decision maker to see. And the last one is also about making this as a living dashboard. So we uh, we just launched this dashboard to to the high level people last last month, but we will continue to improve. Um, now we get the dashboard to many of the program and the users, then we will get feedback and we'll add more and try to improve. And now last one is just about the next step. So with this dashboard, now they can easily get access to data. We will also use this tool as the one of the way to introduce or to encourage the data use culture in, in the country. Now that they don't have to uh, use the username and password to log in, they can get data at their hands and then it will promote the data use more. And we also plan uh, maybe this to use the dashboard for the m and &E work so that they can also get the high level uh, view of the program here. And I also mentioned now the data are from DH2 instances in the future, maybe we want data from more sources uh, for different purposes and at least they can have uh, some information like uh, climate or maybe the for flood monitoring, etc. And lastly, that uh, Austin also mentioned, but for us right now, we, are, we, we mentioned it's a public dashboard, but not nearly the public. So it's mainly for uh, the high level people to access without username and password. But at some point in the future, maybe we would like to have this uh, dashboard to be accessible by the public and at least the public can get some ideas of, of, of the country, or at least, uh, like I said, um, maybe from fun people that really want to know something about their, their areas or the communities. Yep, that's uh, the overview. So we'd like just to show a couple of the uh, screenshots of the, 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 the dashboard. So as you can see over there on the corner, we will have different lists of the dashboard that they can select and uh, go through. And if you want to see it's uh, public and you can also uh, access this website and hopefully uh, you can also give us some feedback to improve. But as you can see now, um, the graph, the chart might be different from what you see in the two. We, as I said, the main goal is also to tell the stories. At least for the top row, you can see or uh, the high level people when they see, at least they know um, compared to last year, the same period, how uh, we are doing. For example, the SBA compared to this time last year, you see that it's decreased. Uh, Etc. Yeah, and the same uh, for family health. You see, uh, just that's the one activities that we we did in Laos and not go through in the detail. But just to show you different type of uh, chart, the graph that we can do, and also the same on about health facilities that at least they get the idea of now how many facilities are there, how many health workers um, in the country. And by, I said, the almost real time, when new data are entered, then this graph should change. And at least they, they, they know the progress or they can keep track of, of the, the um, progress. Yep, and one last thing is also about the mobile. So this is the main goal that they can see the same graph um, on, the, on their phone and then be able to quickly scroll and see the high level of the, the data. Yep, and maybe uh, I can talk a little bit on the technical part. Okay. Uh, okay, hello. Can you hear me right? Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Nghe from uh, his Vietnam. I'm a technical uh, implementer. Uh, now we come to the <laughs> sleepy part. Uh, I will. Just uh, maybe talk is very uh, over overall so you too can easy to understand. Okay, uh, this is uh, 
how does uh, our public dashboard work uh, currently in Laos. Uh, in the public dashboard, we have uh, currently we have two parts. First is the front end part. It's a page that uh, Sam already showed you in a reverse line, uh, many chart, many uh, graph table. That is a front end part. And uh, the main technology we use for front end part is uh, React.js. And we include inside, inside that in many uh, useful library for showing the chart map by uh, table. Uh, by uh, like uh, chart GS, high chart, leaflet, and data grid. Yeah. And, uh, and then about the data, uh, the front end, we get the data from the back end. You can see, you can call it a middleware. And uh, we're using the Express GS. This is a back end uh, web based application form. Uh, of the Node.js and uh, by the help of the Express.js, we can easy to create the environment for the backend and also create many our custom API for the front end can use it for uh, requesting the data. <clears throat> and uh, then uh, from the back end, we will request the data into the A2 to get the data. So the front end will, you can see here, will not directly connect to the uh, the to to request the data. Uh, then back end we use the library ICS. Uh, from that library we have many authentication type to connect to the data to like basic authentication. Always here you can to pass authentication by token uh, to connect to the data to, and uh, then the data to will uh, return the data back to the back end. And inside the back end we will transfer transform the data, combine the data into uh, uh, the object and then send back to the uh, front end to use this. Uh, why we need to do that? Because we are support, we can uh, request, we can connect requests and getting data to multiple DA2. So maybe after you request, uh, you get the data, you want to combine that data into one chart. So that's really in the middle where to do it for you. And then you push it into the front end to see. <clears throat> uh, and uh, in the future, we, like Sam said, we will try to uh, get data from different data sources, like from the Excel, from MySQL and SQL Lite. Right. That's if I, in the future case. <clears throat> and uh, for the security here right now, we just uh, using, for now, we're just using the basic authentication, username and smart word, but it's put into the back end and uh, put in the same day two instance. So, uh, as a container, uh, the box strip container. <clears throat> but uh, maybe in the future, we will plan to use Lite because we do use uh, the token or maybe we will use the event hook when every time the day to running, after running analytics, we can pull the data again for update for the dashboard. We have the newest data every day. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's all from my part from the technical stack. Great, thank you, Nick, and, uh, and Sam as well. Thank you very much. Is that, was that the end of the presentation? Yeah, great, yeah. Thank you for sharing. Um, I think this is a great, uh, a great example of kind of the progression that we see oftentimes with um, moving to uh, public access to data, right? You wanna get it in the hands of decision makers, um, but you also want to make it uh, available to, uh, to the broader public. Um, and so we'll talk next a little bit about the, the different considerations that are important when going through that transition, especially when you go to the public as a whole. Um, but before we do that, if we, we have a few minutes maybe for questions for the, the His Vietnam team um, about the Lao public dashboard, um, and then we'll dive into the, um, the kind of guidance. Just a couple, couple minutes if anybody has quick questions in here or online. We have one in the in the room here. Hi, I, am I audible? Am I audible? Just keep it close to your mouth, and it should be fine. All right. I I would like just like to know um, about the decision making process. Uh, who decided what elements they need uh, on there? You talked about um, the national assembly having very specific requirements, uh, but uh, we all know that. Uh, 
there could be different requirements in terms of like uh, general health, in terms of maybe a specific disease and things like that. And what was the process of deciding what goes up there and uh, what doesn't go up there? I would like to know that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now. Um, so in terms of what that, what indicators we you put up there. So uh, first of all, we like I mentioned, we, we have different uh, indicators that at least at the national and even the provincial level that they, they need to monitor frequently. So those are the things that we put up there that every program, they agree that they need to to see that. And also the high level people, they, they agree that um, they, sh they want to see those. But in terms of, uh, apart from, from those things, that the health program will, will decide and will tell us like uh, what else that they, they want to see, the thing that the boss want to see, and the also thing that the lower level need to see. Right. So mostly we work with the program, also with the uh, WHO that support each program to decide well, what additional information or indicators that um, they would like to be added in the dashboard. There is one question, a uh, technical question online. Um, uh, is there any caching at the Node.js layer here, um, or does it, do the requests go directly to the DHS2 servers? Is there any caching there? Okay. Uh, yeah, we uh, have the caching in the middleware. Yeah, after the one time you request the data, it's we really storing there also. Mm -hmm. So you don't need to request uh, again when you reload the, the website. Mm -hmm. uh, Currently, it will expire after 24 hours. Mm. Yeah, maybe in future, we will set it and combine it with event hook to replace it based on the analytics table time. Mm -hmm. And the analytics, th this next question is about analytics table time. Uh, so for you have real-time data, but it's every, it's every day, right? So it's 24 hours. So you're running analytics once per day and then using that data. Is that correct? Um, we have a few more questions. It seems like this is a, an interesting topic. I do want to get to the the guidance. Um, so there's just this one one last question, which is, um, yeah, maybe yeah, how do how do you do data quality checks uh, before going public? Um, so I, I think actually I'll I'll touch on that in a little bit later in the um, uh, in the session here today. So how to how to kind of validate and and ensure that you have the data that you want um, before you or that you want to make public before it goes public. So I'll, I think I'll get into that in, in the more general guidance. Um, I think there was a question from the other room, but I don't know if that's, yeah. Yeah, covered, okay. Um, yeah, okay, we'll we'll go, we'll stay uh, with this for now and then we'll go through the, the guidance because that's a, there's probably, probably gonna be some questions on that too. Thank you everyone for your patience as we go through this. Okay, so um, there are a few categories of uh, considerations that uh, we've compiled from different uh, different groups that have built public dashboards on top of DHIS2. And this is just sort of scratching the surface of what are some common things that everyone should be thinking about as you're making uh, data public um, and DHS uh, giving the public access to data that maybe is collected or stored in DHS too. Um, so one important consideration, probably the, the biggest one that we see um, sometimes being overlooked uh, is security, right? So this is should, should be top of mind as you're making data public is how do you uh, make that secure? How do you make sure that you're giving the public access without uh, giving them access to the DHS2 system without giving them access to um, even be able to find that DHS2 system in, in many cases. Uh, and in particular, um, hiding credentials. So sometimes the easiest way to build a public dashboard is to put uh, your username and password in some JavaScript and put it on the web somewhere. And then you have a, a pretty graph that you can see. But then whoever looks at that and knows how to right click and say view source can see your username and password and access your DHS2 system. And just unilaterally, that is bad. Please do not do that. <laughs> we do see that sometimes and it's even historically has been a way to embed um, visualizations in systems, but there are much better ways to do it. Uh, 
and and that should be avoided when you're especially when you're giving access to the public. This has been something that um, with the the kind of explosion of public dashboards for health in uh, through the COVID pandemic. Um, Lots of people know that there, there are operational systems behind them. There are lots of people that have access to these, these dashboards and try to maybe can explore a little bit and, and find ways to access the system. So these are some very high level um, general security guidelines, but there are uh, definitely more to keep in mind. So as, a, as an overall takeaway, think about security and think about security a lot when you're giving the public access to data. To go through these individually, um, so as a rule, if you're giving the public access to data, you should not give them access to the operational system that is being used by health workers or by the ministry to actually do their jobs. Right, so they can be completely separate systems. They should be connected, but you should never give access to the operational system to the to the general public. Um, even accidentally. So even if somebody is very technically savvy and can right click and say view source or or do all sorts of different things, they shouldn't. You should uh, protect as much as possible that operational system. Um, one way to do that is to hide the credentials. As we said, don't put the username and password in the browser. Um, there are a lot, lots of other ways that you might accidentally expose credentials. So just be be very aware of where the credentials for your operational system are stored. Um, in many cases, it's it's useful even to hide where the operational system is, right? So I'm, I'm saying operational system, I'm, I'm just going to say DHIS2. You might have multiple DHIS2 instances. You might have different systems that are not DHIS2. But if, you, if your uh, public portal that the government website where you go and say um, my, my dashboard.mycountry.gov or whatever it is, uh, if somebody goes there and then they can see the requests that are going to uh, dhs2.mycountry.gov, which is where your operational system is, you're opening up a, a surface area for someone to explore that and to try to hack passwords or, or send phishing links to other people, um, to users of the system. And uh, so ideally you should hide that completely. So in the example from Laos, there, there is a middleware there, right? So the, the browser doesn't talk to DHIS2, the browser talks to a, another server that then does all of the, the talking to DHIS2 on the server side. That helps to protect the, uh, the operational system because unless somebody knows, uh, knows the architecture behind the scenes, they can't just figure out where the DHS2 server is and start to attack it in some way. Um, if possible, it might be useful even to hide the fact that it's a DHS2 system at all. So this isn't strictly necessary, but it can help to kind of have defense in depth uh, to, to not even expose that the, the back end of this system is DHS2. Uh, it might be other systems, it might be multiple systems that are coming together, uh, but if you are using the DHS2 visualization engine and you are using DHS2 APIs, even if that's going to another server and then getting passed on to the, the backend DHS2, then it, it opens up the possibility of uh, someone being able to figure that out and, and use that to, to their advantage in some way. So if it's possible, it might also be useful to explore obfuscating those API signatures or the, the API calls that the front end uh, is making. So this is getting a little bit technical. I'm not going to get too technical in here, but we can dive into what um, kind of how you would actually do this um, another time. Another important consideration is performance. So this is again um, sort of similar to to what we said with security, in that if you have a million or a hundred million people that are all of a sudden accessing the public dashboard that you created, you shouldn't that shouldn't be the same as having 100 million new users in your DHIS2 system, right? Which will probably take down your DHIS2 system. I, I would say definitely if you have 100 million users. Um, if you have 100 million people, uh, this is a little bit of an exaggeration, let's say even a million people. If you have a million people that are accessing your public dashboard, um, that shouldn't change at all, The ideally, the uh, performance or the stability of the DHIS2 system that you're actually using in, in your country for your operational systems. So that's another 
important uh, goal or, or consideration here. Um, there were some questions about caching and, and the, the, the team in Lao uh, answered as well saying that, uh, yes, caching is, is done in the middleware. That's very important because if you are saying every time somebody hits refresh in their browser and you have a, a million or 10 million people that are hitting refresh in their browser to figure out what today's COVID case numbers are, you shouldn't have every single one of those refresh clicks uh, go and hit DHIS2. That can be problematic. So instead, giving uh, data uh, that is close to real time is almost always better than than getting than re refreshing every single time somebody clicks refresh. So even if you cache for in the, in the case of the that Lao public dashboard, it was 24 hours. Maybe you need maybe you cache for an hour. But it's public data, so it shouldn't be changing based on who's looking at it. So you can cache uh, very aggressively here to, to avoid any issues. It also is possible to pre-compute or pre-generate a lot of the visualizations or, or the data that is being displayed in the browser to the public. So if that's a possibility for you, there's some more technical considerations into how to actually do this. That's something to consider as well. There are other, other benefits we'll talk about um, for doing that in a minute. The next example uh, or consideration is timeliness. So as I mentioned, probably up to the minute timeliness, like real time data, isn't actually useful or necessary for the public. If you have an actual public dashboard, you don't need, people don't need to know what happened in the last hour in most cases, right? Uh, one day is probably fine. One month might even be fine in a lot of cases because people aren't even necessarily looking at daily daily data. A little bit different in a, in in the case of COVID, but in most cases you're looking at how how is the country doing this month or this year compared to last year or last month, and um, so you can use that to your advantage to be able to. Um, Avoid, to, to uh, address some of the performance impacts of trying to give real-time data is that you don't often need it in most cases. So you can do aggressive caching again. You can pre-generate or pre-compute things um, before people actually request them. The next consideration is privacy and access control. And this is not the same as security. So it's it's related and sometimes we say security and privacy in the same sentence, but they're not the same thing. So in, in the technical security um, considerations, we're talking about how people might hack your system. Privacy is a little bit different in that you don't want to expose the public, not necessarily people that are hacking, but you don't want to give individual personally identifiable information on your public portal, for example. Um, or even maybe you you don't want to give access to some sensitive aggregate data that you that is maybe used uh, internally in the ministry but isn't uh, ready to be published yet, right? So you want to think about what data is actually being exposed to the public. And this is uh, there were some questions online about this as well. I think this is an important consideration for public data access is what data is actually being shared and who gets to decide what data is shared. And if you're, if you're just all of a sudden clicking a, clicking a button and uh, exposing all of the data in DHS2 to the public, depending on your DHS2 system, that might be really bad or it might be fine. It really depends. So you need to know in the context of your country, the politics in that country, um, where, what, who gets to decide what's public and how, what is the process to kind of approve data for publication. Transparency is in general a good thing, but sometimes you need to uh, make sure you're following the right process to make sure that you're not publishing even data that might be correct or up to date, but is not necessarily cleaned up enough yet and could be misinterpreted by the public. So that's also something very important to consider is that you're not just putting the data out there, but also you're, you're, you need to make sure that people understand what that data means and don't misinterpret it in some way. So generally, I would say public data should be as explicitly selected and approved as possible. Um, there, you can automate that and you can reduce the, the kind of burden of that process. But generally, you want to make sure that 
it's well known what data is going to be made public and how you're going to do that. And then there, there's a few considerations here on this next one, next two slides that are a little bit less, um, less critical maybe, but are quite important when we're talking about access to the public, um, and that is usability. So we're talking about a very different user base when you're building a public portal than when you're building a DHS2 system, for example, right? So you don't want to have to have a huge training campaign to be able to train people to use a sophisticated tool. You want to make it as usable and as accessible as possible to the people uh, who are actually going to visualize that data or see that data and use it. Um, and those are typically, they can be people that are less technically literate, for example. There can, they can be people who have all sorts of different types of devices from very low spec phones to every browser imaginable and coming from all different countries and different languages and all these different things. So usability, and there's a lot of considerations here on this slide and the next one that I won't go into too, um, uh, too much detail, but they're important also to, to keep in mind when you're building a public portal, um, not just on top of DHS2, but just building something that's accessible to the public. Um, but one way that this ties in with some of the earlier slides is that the, the performance in the browser is also very important to consider. So you don't want it to take a very long time for someone to load that data. Um, you don't want to make a bunch of API calls. And if you're able to do that by pre-computing or pre-generating some images or um, doing server-side generation or aggressive caching, you can also have some of the security and performance benefits that we talked about. Some other considerations for usability, we won't go into too much detail here. Um, responsive design is, is also something we saw in the, in the example from the Lao uh, public dashboard that um, it's, it's accessible on mobile devices. That's probably the, the majority of users these days will be accessing it from a mobile device rather than from a desktop. So think about that when you're designing your, your public portal. Um, there are lots of other considerations here that are worth uh, exploring as well. This one was brought up by one of the um, HIS groups. So we collaborated with a, a bunch of developers from different HIS groups who have built public portals. Um, and this was a good addition from that group um, as well, which is that user support and troubleshooting is very important because if all of a sudden you have a million people that are trying to call someone to figure out how to use this, this public website, you need to make sure that you have processes for that. Do they have an email address? Who's gonna be checking that email address? Do you have a call center? All these different things. So depending on the use case, it can be quite important. And I think that was something that was brought up um, quite a bit during the, the, the explosion again of kind of public portals for COVID data. Okay, now I wanted to share um, quickly the, the results of this um, poll or this quiz. I guess what whatever it was called. <laughs> Let's see what it was. Oh no, I need to figure out how to get the results. They're gonna be on my computer. Um, but while I go through that, uh, yeah, feel free to go ahead and add some more if you um, if you haven't scanned this yet. While I'm while I'm doing that, does anyone have any questions on those on those considerations? I went went through them pretty quickly, but maybe we and on next uh, step, I'll talk a little bit about a few kind of low hanging fruit of easy ways you can achieve some of those with uh, some some easy technical choices. Um, but does anyone have any questions or additions to that list? Oh, well, so I have uh, two questions. Yep. First one is, uh, is this process um, applicable to almost all versions or are there any considerations? And second one is, uh, is there documentation available for the implementation part or uh, development part mm -hmm. of this process to make the dashboard public? Yeah. Thank you. Good, good question. So 
the first first question was uh, around version like dhs2 versions you mean yes yeah so these are general considerations that it doesn't even necessarily have to be a dhs2 system behind this this public portal this is generally advice and 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 guidance around how to build a public access to an operational health system for example um so it doesn't matter what version of dhs2 you're running there might be some nuances or differences in the way you actually implement some of those considerations based on the version of dhs2 that you're using um and the second question was a good one is are, is there documentation and guidance um it's hard to have uh like a step-by-step -step guide for how to do this because it's it's a bit different in every every country every context um but that's what we're working on so I, I'll, I'll get to this in uh, in a minute but basically the next steps are uh, we have some of these kind of guide guidance for how to do this um, in a pr fairly easy way. We're going to be publishing that and also looking at doing uh, building a, a reference implementation that someone could could base their their implementation on if they wanted to, that follows or or, or takes in takes these considerations into account and could adapt that to their local use case. Um, and that'll also in, involve some uh, guidance on how to do this technically as well as uh, more. Uh, expansion on the the considerations that i went over today good question so, Thank you. Austin, can you hear us we can yes go ahead there we go scott's got some questions in the overspill auditorium thank you uh yes I, actually it's a question about the use of dhis2 not maybe for the broad public but for partners working with the ministry of health is that you, you hear me yeah okay uh, because you know, in, in many countries, it's always cumbersome to go to the uh, Ministry of Health and the Department of, of uh, Health Information to ask for them to make the request. So I'm I'm wondering if we can use the HIS2 with an access that it's only consultation for uh, not broad public but some partners working with uh, the Ministry of Health. And if you recommend to do that, or if you recommend not to do that, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's uh, to some extent what what was done in Laos. Um, I, I think uh, so. It's it's kind of a a slightly narrower scope of ex of what we're talking about here. So one way to do that would be just be to make a public portal and make it pu available to the public to everyone. Um, but maybe you don't want to do that. Maybe there's some data that's a little bit more sensitive or you don't want to be misinterpreted or those types of things. So maybe you want to do this, but put it behind a uh, an intranet or, or, or a password on the on the public portal. So still anyone any any of the partners can access that can can drill down can maybe see um, some details um, they're not accessing the operational system doesn't matter how many people uh, access that it's still going to going to um, have functionality in the operational system continue um, so you could use a lot of these techniques to do that as well um, but it's important to think about like putting it on the public internet means that it's public so if you're just wanting it to be exposed to a certain subset, so a certain set of partners or something like that. When it's when it's on the public internet, it's public, and and you have to consider all of these things. Um, you might be able to get away with uh, avoiding a few of them potentially if you put it behind a username and password, um, or uh, give give people access in some other way. Hopefully that answers your question. One more question, Austin. Sure. Yeah, thank you. Uh, this is Devin. I, I just wanted to ask um, about the reuse of DHIS2 analytics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, when developing uh, web portals, uh, most times I uh, would want to save time to come out with these uh, nice uh, public portals. And already we know there are some analytics that have been done, analysis have been done, generated in within DHIS2. Um, and uh, from within some version, I think 3.5 backward, we used to have uh, things to do with plugins and the like that could be used to help or aid uh, and fast track the process of public uh, portals. Yeah. Is this something that's yet being maintained? And uh, if so, how simplified is it to allow public portals to reuse uh, analysis objects that are within the DHIS2? It's a good question. Um, and so this is something that I think in in our technical guidance, we'd like to make possible. 
um, because there is a lot of power in the the visualization engine of DHIS2, the 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 analytics APIs, as well as the the tools that have been built that you can design something in Data Visualizer and then it shows up on the dashboard. And maybe you just want to make that particular visualization available to the public. Um, the way the previous way to be able to embed that in an external website was not very secure, so we have had removed that for that reason. Um, but it is something that would uh, we'd like to to make possible. Um, it, it does kind of defeat the purpose of avoiding exposing that DHS2 is there because you're using DHS2 in some ways. But maybe that's not a, a, that important of a consideration in your use case, and it would be useful to. Um, make it possible anyway. It It is possible even today, but we need to build some guidance around how to actually embed that visualization in a public website and how to securely uh, basically use a gateway to protect the operational system with caching and with um, hiding of the, the URL of the operational system and uh, hiding the credentials of that operational system. So there are ways to do it, but it's, and there are uh, organizations, um, HISP Uganda comes to mind and a few others that have, have explored doing this um, in different ways. Um, but we wanna make sure that we have clear guidance on how to do that in while maintaining security and performance of your operational DHS2 instance. Which maybe, thank you for that question. That was a good question. And that maybe gets me to this first recommendation. So I'm gonna go through these six recommendations that are kind of high level. You might not adopt all of them. These are just things that you might wanna to consider to have some quick wins in terms of doing some of these, uh, having some of this protection for uh, the data that you're making public and for your operational system. And so one of those that's kind of an easy win, a clear win is don't, don't give anybody public access to your DHS2 uh, operational system, have one that's dedicated that only has public data in it. So even if somebody got a username and password for that system, it wouldn't help them at all because all they can see is the public data anyway, right? So if you have a DHS2 system that, or DHS2 instance that is just public data, you can use the new aggregate data exchange service and application in the operational system to manually review and publish the data that you want to be public to that other system. And then you have a, basically you can give, you can be a little bit, uh, you're a little bit more protected uh, by giving the public somehow access to that uh, public DHS2 instance. Um, even if you're not gonna give them actually username and password, you're still, uh, you still have a kind of a layer of, of protection there. The second, which I would recommend, even if you have all of the public data in, in a dedicated system, is to use a proxy or reverse proxy is actually the, the correct term, which protects the DHS2 credentials uh, and limits the impact on the production DHS2 system um, by implementing caching, by um, uh, performing rate limiting, different things like this. Um, Nginx is a one way to do this. There are other ways, but the they're very good systems for basically giving the public access to backend services in a performant and secure way. Um, so that is a general recommendation that you should you should probably always do that when you're having uh, giving the public access to something. Um, and if possible, this this ties with, in with number one again. You should do pushing data instead of pulling data, right? So. You don't necessarily need to do this if you have caching set up correctly, but it's more predictable if your operational system pushes the public data on a regular basis, or maybe somebody manually approves it uh, to a place where then it can be accessed by whoever. Maybe it's even published to Google Drive or something. It, 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 you can push your data when you know when you know that you're ready to put this make this data public. Uh, on a regular basis, maybe once a day, you can push it somewhere and then give other people access to it in some way using some, one of these other systems. So you can do that with the aggregate data exchange app. You can also do it in other ways where you ex export to Excel and upload that to an FTP server, all sorts of ways that you could could do that. Um, but pushing it instead of pulling, pulling meaning using the DHS2 API to when somebody hits refresh in their in their browser on the public dashboard, pull that data from DHS2, it's much more predictable to instead push it from the system to somewhere where it, the public has access. 
And three more recommendations. I know we're a little bit over time, so feel free to leave if you if you have to. I apologize, we had a little bit of a delayed start. Um, but if if possible, uh, you might want to hide DHS2 specific signatures. So you would maybe hash the API calls that are being sent, and then you use that hash instead of the actual API signature, so that people can't kind of manipulate it by saying, "All right, I see that this API call is being sent for this." Uh, particular visualization or this particular set of data? What if I change the ID to this something else that I know exists? Or what if I uh, try to like expand that out and, and find some data that I'm not supposed to have access to? So if you don't let them do that by like basically um, saying that the API is not is, is not the full DHS2 API, it's only certain, uh, certain calls that have certain um, ways to access it, that could be helpful. Um, something to think about. Uh, the fifth one here is use server-side generation if possible. This helps a lot with performance, uh, not only of DHS2, but also of the public website. So if you can pre-generate the images of the visualizations that you want or the JSON for the data uh, of this public um, data, and you do that on a daily basis, you do that on the server, then the browser doesn't need to make a bunch of requests to the API over and over and over again. And you don't need to request it from DHS2 over and over and over again. You can generate that on the server side, which makes everything go a lot faster and uh, is more predictable. And then the last one is just don't, don't reinvent the wheel. So don't, be, uh, don't build everything from scratch because there's a lot of tools out there that are very good for a lot of these things. So try to figure out how to piece together existing tools rather than building them all from scratch and writing a bunch of a uh, bunch of code in in Node.js or Java because that's also a very easy way to accidentally introduce security or performance issues um, if you're, you're not very careful about how you do that. So again, what's next is we're going to be publishing some of this guidance, the considerations that I shared, um, consider, continuing to collaborate with um, our partners, HISP groups, all of you. So everybody that, um, ha if you have ideas for how we can improve this guidance or what you'd like to see from this type of guidance, uh, send me an email, austin at dhs2.org. I'll share that um, on here as well. Uh, and we'd love to involve you in that. We'd love to share that guidance and also develop it into a more of a technical guide for how to do this. If you're starting from scratch, um, you can probably adapt that to your local, um, the, the, the way that you need to do it in your local context. Um, yeah, I think that's about it. The, I think, thank everyone for um, sharing the uh, examples. Um, so we have another like 15 or 16 examples of public portals here. Um, be great to work with all of you um, on, yeah, kind of curating a little bit of a, um, uh, a list of those that, that we might be able to, um, yeah, to share or to, or to use uh, as we develop some of this guidance. Um, so thank you all for sharing that and thank you for your time. Uh, apologies for going a little bit over, but hopefully it was a useful uh, discussion. Feel free to come up uh, and talk to me or send me an email if you have any questions after. Thank you. And and thank you again to Sam and Ya for uh, the Vietnam presentation. So.